A formal welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm Sophie Hazelhurst. Um, I'm a chartered financial advisor at Integrity 365. And I'm Karina Dutton. A lot of you may or may not know me. I think there's some, some of my clients on. So hello, I'm also a Chartered Financial Advisor and also work for Integrity 365. The topic of today is all about inheritance tax planning. So just to give you a, a little summary of the areas that we're going to go through today, so you can get an idea of sort of how we're going to structure the, the different parts of inheritance tax and what we're doing. So today we're going to help you to understand inheritance tax, how you can pass on your assets tax efficiently. So that's a question we often get asked. Mm. And how you can pay less inheritance tax. Again, this is very common questions. And um, how can you plan to cover an inheritance tax liability? So you might not be able to completely get rid of your liability, but what can you do to, to sort of cover that or make sure it's easy for your um, beneficiaries to pay? Most importantly, as far as I'm concerned, and I know Karina's very excited about this, we're going to be answering your questions. So as we go through this webinar, it is recorded. Um, there is an option for um, a Q&A and also a chat. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. If you've got any questions, please do ask them. We have got some that have been sent in uh, advance for our, from our clients. Um, and I know sort of I've been to see someone this week and they've raised a couple of questions. So if there's anything you want to ask or a specific area or anything you're not sure about, please do make sure you say that in the chat box or in the Q&A. So sort of inheritance tax started um, way back when, um, sort of about 1894, and that's when modern day inheritance tax started. Um, it was sort of the government needed to raise money. So what they did was they took away all the old taxes that originally started from the Napoleonic Wars and said, right, we're going to tax people's land as it was back then at um, you know, a rate to be able to raise the money to get rid of the deficit from all the wars that they were having. So what that means for us today is inheritance tax is 40% at anything above the nil rate band. Now for us, what that means is that um, we'll go through the nil rate band in a minute and what that really means for you all as individuals, um, but 40% above a nil rate band. You can reduce that down to 36%. If you give 10% of your net estate to charity. So those are the sort of rates of inheritance tax that you should be aware of. So some key statistics for you. So 80% of UK household wealth is held by the over 45s. Now, this isn't something that's particularly new. But it's something to be aware of that there is a vast sort of difference in people's wealth, depending on age. Um, and why is 80 percent of the UK's um, household wealth being held by over 45 is important as far as inheritance tax concerned? Um, that's because a lot of people who are in that category might not be around in a few years time, which is likely to create some inheritance tax problems. So 5.5 trillion. So that's the globally estimated uh, amount to transfer in inheritance tax and gifts in the next 20 to 30 years. So that's not a vast amount of time when we look back 20 years, really. I still think 20 years ago was 1980, um, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, if we think about the changes that have happened in the last 20 years and, and moving forward 20 years, that's a lot of money that's going to be passed on. So 327 billion. So that's going to be transferred to 300,000 younger people in the UK at that time. So what we're saying is there's a lot of money and that's then going to be passed on in the UK to, you know, 300,000 younger people at that time. And for me personally, and I don't know how you feel about this, Karina, but 6.1 billion. So that's Crazy. how much. <laughs> yes, that's how much was collected in inheritance tax by HMRC in 2021, which is the, the latest uh, statistics that we have. 
that's that's quite scary really isn't it that's a lot of money to be raised from inheritance tax yeah it really is and I think that that's why it was important for us to kind of raise this as a subject to make sure everyone's aware of just how much money the government are making on it definitely <laughs> So I mentioned about the 40% above the nil rate band. So to give you an idea of what the nil rate band is. So that's essentially how much you can pass on to whomever you want without an inheritance tax liability. So on this slide, you can see here. So they, um, they've frozen the nil rate band at 325,000 since April 2009. So that hasn't changed in uh, you know a very long time but what has changed in that time is the fact that housing so we can see here on you know um the value of um how much house prices are changing how much house prices have increased since april 2009 and stock markets have increased as well um so you know assets are generally higher so estates are higher and therefore more and more people are starting to be pushed into that band above the nil rate band but the big question is and for most of our clients how can we reduce this so um apologies to any of my clients who are on this who've seen this before but whenever i talk about inheritance tax i say right you've got four options when it comes to inheritance tax now, the first one that uh, my mum and my dad seems to be taking very seriously at the moment is spend it. So <laughs> if you've got money, you spend it. Or um, as my dad likes to call it, skiing, which is spending the kids' inheritance. So if you spend more money, you're going to have less money in your estate. So it's a very good way of being able to enjoy the life <laughs> that you've got um, by spending it and enjoying it. So, so that's something to be aware of. And it, it's quite important, I think, because there's no point in you sort of not enjoying the lives that you've built together or as a family um, and then passing all that money on, but losing it to in, some of it to inheritance tax. Um, so it's always a nice one to talk about that. The next one is gifting. So when we talk about gifting, there's two different ways in which you can gift money. That's directly or indirectly. So when I say directly, that's where you physically give an individual money. So that might be uh, to a child, to a grandchild, um, something like that. You can give the money directly. And that's something called a potentially exempt transfer. Or you can give money to an entity or to a trust and that's something called an indirect gift or a chargeable lifetime transfer now please don't feel you have to remember those terms but it's just worth bearing those in mind so with both of those you can give money away that will reduce your estate for inheritance tax planning and therefore there's less of the estate to pay inheritance tax on um, thirdly, so um, there's something called business relief, which was brought in in the 1970s. So that was brought in to enable people to be able to pass their small UK companies on to the next generation without then paying a huge amount of um, death duties as it was at the time. Now, we can still benefit from that in this day and age by buying shares in small UK companies. Now, you know, that's quite a complex area, but essentially it means that if you own assets that qualify for this, you can get um, inheritance tax at 0% rather than 40%. So again, saving you some inheritance tax. And finally, the last one is you can get something called whole of life cover. So that's where um, Karina will go into far more detail than, than I will hear. But essentially it's where you can get life cover for the rest of your life in order to have the money there to pay the inheritance tax bill. So that's our sort of four main areas when it comes to inheritance tax planning. Fabulous. Thanks, Sophie. So I guess my bit then will be on a bit more about gifts and exemptions. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you all a little bit about the different exemptions that are that are out there. So um, if you are to pass money on to a UK domiciled spouse or registered civil partner, um, so if you were to pass away and you were to leave everything to your UK domiciled spouse or civil partner, then that would be uh, what's called exempt. So there wouldn't be any inheritance tax liability at that time. Um, you've also got an annual gift exemption, um, which is currently £3,000. 
I think it's been £3,000 for a very long time. Um, and you are able to go back um, the last year. So if you didn't use last year's, you can actually gift up to £6,000, but you can only go back one year. Um, so that's something else that you can use on, a, on an annual basis. Um, you've then got wedding and civil partnership gifts. So depending on who you're gifting the money to as to how much you could leave uh, or give them without having to worry about any inheritance tax implications. So if it's your child, for example, you can gift £5,000. Uh, if it's a grandchild, you can gift two and a half thousand. Uh, and if it's anyone else, you can gift up to a thousand pounds. So if you're feeling generous and want to have a nice day out at a wedding, then you can gift them a thousand pounds and have no worries regarding the I uh, IHT so, uh, side of things. So that's good. Um, and the final one really is gifts out of uh, normal expenditure. Um, now, this can include life insurance premiums, uh, but the, the key thing with gifts out of normal expenditure is that it doesn't affect your standard of living, um, which isn't always that easy to, to prove. But a lot of um, grandparents, for example, use that particular rule to help pay for school fees. That's quite common. Um, and as I say, it's very important that you get the right advice on it before going ahead with it. But the, the key thing with gifts out of normal expenditure is that you uh, you, you don't sort of leave yourself short so long as you've still got enough income to be getting on with your normal standard of living. So they're the four kind of key main exemptions. If we then move on to look at um, life cover for gifts, which is what we've, we've sort of been talking about in a bit more detail. Um, I mean, you know, the thing to think about is, is an inheritance tax liability. Um, you know, a good way to reduce it is to make gifts out of your assets during your lifetime. Uh, and as Sophie's already mentioned, it could be a potentially exempt transfer um, and it would potentially become IHT free after seven years. So a nice seven year clock there that starts ticking as soon as the, the gift is made. Um, so if you were to pass away during that seven year term after making them, potentially there would be an inheritance tax liability to consider. Uh, but if you survive that seven years, then, then you know, hopefully it would be outside of your estate for inheritance tax reasons and there wouldn't be any implications there. Um, so that's uh, obviously something to be aware of with gifts. Um, so one way to, to sort of make sure that the potential tax bill is provided for on death is to put in a whole of life cover policy. So a lot of us think of, whole, of life cover as, as something that we've maybe put in place to cover a mortgage or when the kids are young or something along those lines. But actually, whole of life cover is a different sort of product, really. It's designed to pay out a lump sum on your death whenever that occurs. Um, so, you know, it might be tomorrow. It might be at age 110. It will pay out on death. And the key thing there is that that money would pay, hopefully, interest to your beneficiaries. So um, you don't have to worry about sort of them having to worry about probate and et cetera. It would pay out to your beneficiaries interest that so goes straight to them. They could rock up to HMRC with a cheque and say, there you go, there's an inheritance tax, um, be on your way, let me, you know, let me inherit everything that, that mum and dad left me, for example. So it's just, you know, a, a really useful tool uh, that a lot of people tend to use, especially a lot of people who might have assets tied up in property or that don't have the capability of making gifts, for example, um, but they've got enough income to pay for a, a whole of life cover policy because they're not cheap. Um, it's not necessarily as expensive as you think but it's not gonna be as cheap as a sort of 10,000 pound life cover to cover your mortgage. Um, so, but it is a complex area. So always a good idea to get advice on whole of life cover. And um, there's a number of pitfalls that could you could fall into. So it's always a really good idea to get proper financial advice before getting an off the peg uh, product that could be the wrong thing. Um, so a bit more about whole of life and, and the sort of trust situation. So, um, you know, really important that, that whole of life assurance is written in trust. As I said, if it's not written in trust, that, that money payable from the life cover policy would go into the estate and be subject to 40% inheritance tax. Complete waste of time, money and effort. And um, so really important that a trust is used um, alongside the whole of life cover. Um, so, you know, some individuals who've got a, a large estate with a potential inheritance tax liability, they might lack the means or desire for that, that matter to gift lump sums or invest into business relief assets, which is something that, that Sophie's already touched on. Um, in order to reduce their inheritance tax liability. So it can be a really affordable and sustainable way to provide the funds um, to pay for that, that liability, um, especially for people with liquid, no liquid assets, but they've got surplus income. So as I said, people that have got a lot of property or they've got assets that are, are sort of tied up in one way or the other, um, but they do have enough income to pay for that policy. Um, 
So for married couples or civil partners, just something to be aware of is that um, inheritance tax is generally deferred until the second death. So um, it's always a good idea if you're setting up whole of life cover, it would be based on a second death basis. Because what we don't want to happen is it pay out on the death of the first partner, it then go to the second partner, and then when they die, all that money potentially could be subject to inheritance tax. So it would be paid on the second death if it's a if it's a married couple that are looking to to cover it. So again, an, another very good reason to make sure that that the, the sort of advice is sought at this time, really. So that's just a little bit more about sort of whole of life and trust. And you know, it's something that your advisor will be able to explain in a bit more detail. Would be able to get quotes. You can um, you know have a look at. You know, for example, how much would it cover pay to cover my entire inheritance tax liability? Or some people say, well, look, I'm not going to be able to afford that because my inheritance tax liability is quite chunky or I'm in poor health, so it might be a bit more expensive. But you could, for example, ask your advisor to say, well, look, I've got X, Y, Z amount of money to put towards this per month. How much cover can I get? And by doing that, it means that you've got, at least got some cover in place. So it means that part of the, the bill would be paid in the event of, uh, of the death of two of you or one of you if you're not if you're on your own um so that's that side of it um i think the next thing we're going to do sophie is just go through a bit of a case study i think oh yes i always think it's really great to talk about these things but i love learning by example so what we've got here karina is a case study so we have mr and mrs jones so they've got a three million pound estate um, now, the chances are we're getting more and more people who are like this because house prices are going up so much. Mm. So Mr. and Mrs. James, they've got three million pounds. They've got four grandchildren and six grandchildren. Don't tell my mum that she'll be having a go at all of us. Um, <laughs> but um, they've got an estimated tax bill of £940,000, which is that's a lot of money. It's nearly a million pounds in inheritance tax there. So that's sort of um, 40 percent above their um, sort of nil weight bands. Mm -hmm. So that means after tax, there's only going to be just over two million pounds left to pass down. So that's less than 70 percent of the value of their estate. Now, if they came to you, Karina, what would you look at for them? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a number of different things to consider here and, and not everyone you know, fits every every person. So I think what we're, we're just really going to look at a, a couple of the different options that could be available um, in this scenario. So, so the first scenario that could be looked at is to sell the rental property and they could invest the funds into junior ISAs, for example, or in, into other products that would, would go to their children and grandchildren. Um, they could pay for their grandchildren's school fees out of their income, which is something we touched on earlier using the gifts out of normal exemption rule. Um, they could also gift some of their savings into trust funds, which would be a potentially exempt transfer. And again, after seven years, would be outside of their estate for inheritance tax purposes. Um, and they could also transfer some of their investments into more tax efficient solutions, which, again, I know we've touched on, but it's probably a whole webinar in itself going through that side of it. But, you know, there are certain investments that could be exempt from inheritance tax um, after a two year period. So, as I say, it's it's just a combination of things, really, that, that could be used, but it's not necessarily suitable for everyone, which is why we've kind of looked at all of the different areas, potentially, for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. But I guess the key thing here is what, what benefit would it be for them? Um, so if we were to go down this route, for example, um, after they're reducing their estate, it could leave the value at £1.625 million. Um, now, the key thing here is because their estate has now been reduced below £2 million, um, they're now um, eligible for an additional relief. So it's the main residence nil rate band. So that basically means they can hold a total of a million pounds between them without having an inheritance tax liability, which has a big Im impact. It's suddenly gone for six from you know, 650,000 to a million pounds, which is you know, a big, a big difference. So, so that's important. Um, so it, it gets reduced from 940,000 to 250,000 um, once you take into account the, the, the planning that's been done. Now, if they were then to put in place a whole of life cover policy, paying out 250,000 pounds in trust on the second death, then that would pay the remaining inheritance tax bill. Um, and the benefit really of doing that would be that the tax bill could be paid with the life cover in full. Um, all of the assets are then inherited by the family. So they don't have to then think about selling property or cashing in investments, et cetera, to pay the inheritance tax liability. 
Um, and, and it just really avoids that horrible burden of, of what do we do? Because um, a lot of people don't realise that, that you know, how, how quick HMRC expects that inheritance tax to be paid. Um, I think it's six months, is it, Sophie? That's right. And and also they're not going to uh, grant probate without it, Karina, which no. is something I think people, if you've never had to go through that process, then you might not realise the nuances of that. So, you um, you know, Karina's absolutely right. You have quite a short space of time in which you can pay that money. But also you have to give that to HMRC before they'll grant you probate. Mm. And if you can't necessarily access all the other investments or you don't have the cash there, it might mm. be difficult about how you're going to fund that. Yeah, you get a lot of people having to go and look at bridging loans. You get a lot of people, you know, just trying to sort of raise their own cash to pay the inheritance tax um, because, you know, it might not be that the, the children or grandchildren have got the funds to be able to pay that bill themselves. So that's, again, another really good way of providing uh, a lump sum that can be then used to pay that inheritance tax liability. Um, so it just, yeah, just shows there the difference, but a bit of planning, a bit of extra work involved, but really good benefits by, you know, instead of paying 900 or 1,000 to HMRC, you're paying them 250,000, but that's funded by a large cover policy. So you're not actually physically taking that out of your pocket at the time, um, but obviously you've got to pay the life cover pre premiums along the way. Definitely. So I am very much looking forward to some of these, Karina, because I think we're going to be able to go into a bit more detail um, with some of these um, questions that we've got about the areas that sort of you've covered. Um, mm. And thank you to everyone as well, because um, what's brilliant about these webinars is they are interactive. So you have asked questions. <laughs> and so we're really lucky that we've got those sort of questions that we can discuss now. Mm. So I think sort of leading on from what you've sort of said, um, Karina, from, from that last example, which is a, a genuine kind example of one of ours at Integrity 365. Mm. So one of the questions from our client was, our main asset is a high value property and we're concerned that our children would have to sell it to pay inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to prevent this? Yeah, the reason I guess that's a you know a perfect example of somebody that could benefit from using whole of life cover as opposed to gifting because you know there's a lot of people out there that that have property um, but don't necessarily have a great deal else. So you certainly wouldn't want to be gifting um, you know what you do have in cash savings, for example, or investments if 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 the bulk of your uh, assets are in property. So so if you know you've got enough income and you've got a bit of you know spare income coming in then a whole of life cover policy would be perfect for that individual because literally what you do is you put in place the policy, joint names if there's two of you or sole names if there's just one of you, um, and it's set up in trust. You pay the premium. You do have to pay it for the rest of your life. So obviously it's got to be affordable, um, but it does mean that you know you've got that payout on death that would go to whoever you want it to go to in trust. No problem about probate. No worries about having to sell the property. And it, it then you know becomes theirs in full. Um, on your death so again that's a very very good person to consider using whole of life cover for inheritance tax yeah I, I, you're absolutely right Karina and I've genuinely used it for clients where there's a, a special property they want to keep as you said or something like that where you want to keep it in the family it's a way of being able to do that yeah. um, and we've had another question which is sort of I think we have to do these in tandem because they work nicely together but is investing a better option than life insurance that's a tricky one. I mean, I guess the thing I always say to clients, because you sometimes get clients who say, well, I'll have a look at a quote for whole of life cover and see what the price comes out as. And, and it might be that you give them the quote and it comes out as X, Y, Z amount of money. And they might say, oh, gosh, you know, that's a lot more than I was anticipating, for example. And that's not always the case, but some people do expect it to be £12 a month. And I would say, generally speaking, it's more than £12 a month. Um, but, you know, quite often what they'll say is, look, we're not putting we're not prepared to put that much towards it. I'm just going to put that amount in the bank each each um each month or i'm going to put that into an investment each month uh, instead of paying for a life cover policy and what i always say is okay but what if you die next month you've put 300 pounds in for example and what's that going to do very little but if you put in place a life cover policy and you pay a couple of premiums on it and it pays out 300 000 pounds then all of a sudden that becomes a much more valuable product um so i guess it it doesn't always necessarily work for everyone it's got to be someone that's you know got the affordability side of it there but what i would say is there's no guarantee with putting money into investments whereas there's generally a guarantee with life cover as long as you pay the premiums 
and you're honest when you answer the medical questions, then generally speaking, it will pay out. So I think that's a bit more certainty is probably my uh, answer to that one. Definitely. And I wrote an article about this and it's something because I, I love a stat, um, Karina, as you know. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell everyone as well, if you're interested in that, I've done a table about um, example ages and premiums and how long it would take you to save up that money based on general growth rates versus the whole of life. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people might be a bit shocked at the, the figures from that. So um, if you're not sure and you're not, you know, about sort of speaking to your advisor about it yet, or you want to do a bit more research, you know, I do say have a look at some of the webinars and newsletters we've done before um, because it's a really great way to get an understanding of it. Mm. Um, just a quick one as well before we move on from whole of life career as well is there um does there tend to be an age limit imposed on whole of life no generally not i mean this is usually an age limit with term assurance so usually if you want to get a, a life cover policy that that you know covers you for a set period of time so a 10 year period or up to age whatever usually i think ni age 90 is is the sort of um latest that you can do that kind of policy that generally isn't an, an age um uh, sort of for a whole of life cover it depends on the provider some providers are different but generally not but i guess what i would say is don't wait till you're 90 to set up this kind of policy because a it will be very expensive and b you, you've got a more of a chance to have something going on with your health um, so the earlier you set these up, um, the cheaper it will be, generally speaking, and also hopefully the healthier you will be because there's, there's no guarantee of getting cover if you're in poor health because there is medical underwriting to go through. Definitely. Um, and when it comes to sort of what, you know, I would just caveat this and say to um, anyone who's listening as well, Karina is amazing at these. Um, and what we always tend to do as a team, as a whole at Integrity is recommend guaranteed um, whole of life, which tends to mean that your premiums stay the same for the rest of your life. So um, it might seem expensive when you're a bit younger, but then when you're a bit older, it seems like a bargain. So it's always good. yeah there's there's two types there's there's guaranteed and there's reviewable so guaranteed as you say sophie just um will you'll pay the same premium throughout the rest of your life so if it's set at 200 pounds a month it'll be 200 pounds a month for the rest of your life whereas reviewable um it will pay you, you'll pay the premium for 10 years and then at the end of the 10 year period you'll get a letter through the door there'll be a sharp intake of breath and you'll say it's going up by how much um, and it will go up exponentially. This is the trouble with reviewable cover is it's only guaranteed to be the same price for 10 years and then it increases after 10 years. And I think every five years after that. So it's, it's good for some people. So some people who want to do some serious inheritance tax planning within 10 years to get their estate value down, then great reviewable cover might be for them. Um, but people that are looking for a bit more certainty, um, then, then guaranteed cover is always the, the best option. Fab. Um, Thank you so much for that, Karina. I really appreciate that. I think um, there's a couple of questions around properties in general and inheritance tax, which kind of, I think, again, they're sort of similar questions. So the first one is, can I gift my children the house, as I think they mean their, their main house, their main residence, and continue to live in it? And a similar question, which is, um, someone's got a buy-to-let property, which is rented out, um, and they want to give that to their children, but keep the income. So how does how does that work? Yeah, so um, so basically, yeah, you can't really gift something while still benefiting from it. It's usually classed as a gift with reservations. So from an inheritance tax perspective, if you were to gift your house and still live in it, HMRC would probably say, well, actually, you didn't gift it, did you? Um, you're still living in it. So so they'll probably just try and unwind what you feel that you've done and, and count it towards your estate anyway. And the same with the buy to let property, if you're still taking the income from it. In order to gift something, you have to physically gift it and not accept a, you know, any any sort of benefit from it still. Um, so that's not possible, unfortunately. It's certainly not likely to work anyway. Yes. I mean, Karina, you you know, I'm sure you've said this to clients before, as I do. I said, you're more than welcome to do that. But mm. why? Why? what's your motivation behind doing it? And I think that sort of with inheritance tax planning, we can come up with some fabulous um, sort of wonderful ideas and make it as complicated as you want but the reality is is it really doing what you want it to do um, mm. and I think you're absolutely right Karina in those situations there's not much you can do to, other than try and protect it in some other way mm. um, so another one is um, I still need my money to live on but I would like as much um, to go to my children um, as possible without paying too much inheritance tax 
Yeah, and again, that's a tricky one. I mean, it depends on the situation. Well, that, that person says, I still need my money to live on. I mean, presumably that might mean their, their, their built up wealth. So it might be their savings and investments. Um, and they don't want to be gifting that, which is completely understandable. We don't know how long we're going to live. We certainly don't want to be gifting everything. And all of a sudden, we actually need the money later on in life. So I completely understand that. Um, you know, there's not a great deal you can do other than potentially plan in a different way. So that might be if you've got enough income, you could pay for a whole of life cover policy potentially. Um, you know, there's there's different things you could consider. I mean, it might be that, that that individual, for example, has got more than one property. It might be that they could get by without the income from a buy to let property if they were to gift that, for example. Um, and if they still have an inheritance tax liability, they could then put in place a whole of life cover policy. Um, so again, it, you know, it's it's tricky. Um, not everyone's able to gift their their assets, but I would probably say that that you know, whole of life cover. Although I keep going on about it, is potentially a, a way of uh, you know paying for the the bill without you having to gift everything away. You're absolutely right, and and I think the other factor that comes in here as well, Karina, is that if you don't necessarily need an income from it, but you're worried about giving it away in case you need it in the future, for instance, for care fees planning or something like that that's where the business relief assets um, can be quite useful because mm. that, they're qualifying at the 0% rather than 40 and they remain your assets. So some of them will pay an income if you need an income, but ultimately it's still your money mm. so you can access them. And that Absolutely. also leads me on to another question about pensions because the other thing as well is that um, pensions are outside of your estate as far as inheritance tax is concerned. Mm. So um, as Karina was saying, you know, depending on what you need or, or what you can afford to give away from your personal assets, it might be that actually what you choose to do is spend those, but keep your pension intact. So then that can be passed on. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's a, an, an unusual conversation for a lot of people because they put money into their pensions thinking they're going to take it in retirement and then we tell them not to. Um, <laughs> because, you know, usually the, the last thing you should be accessing if you've got an inheritance tax liability is your pension. You should be using your ICES, your investment bonds, your cash, you know, all of your investment portfolio before you actually access your, your pension because you quite rightly said uh, they are free of inheritance tax and they would go to your beneficiaries before probate, et cetera, if it's all set up correctly. So, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. And also, this is a good time, a bit like the wills and power of attorney. Make sure you've updated your um, nominations for your death benefits on your pension. Um, yes. Whomever you're with, sometimes it can be really easy to do. So our group personal pension scheme is with Royal London. Um, you can do it online on their app. Um, it's very simple, but speak to your advisor because you do need to make sure that those are as up to date as possible. And mm. um, you can leave your pension to whomever you want as well. So um, I'm mine at the moment goes to three of my nieces and nephews um, and sort of that doesn't matter because since pension freedoms in 2015, you can leave your pension to whomever you want. So if you're not sure, have a chat with your advisor, have a chat with one of us and we can help you, but just make sure you've got someone on there. Mm. And it's really flexible as well. You can always change it. So if something, something happens in your life that means you want to change your beneficiaries, then you can do that quite easily just by completing a form or like you say, depending on the provider, completing it online. Um, so yeah, it's really a good idea just to make sure that that's up to date and, and you can split it as well. So some people might want to leave, you know, a percentage to children, percentage to their partner, for example. So there's, there's ways and means of getting it to work for you. Definitely. Um, so I've got a really interesting question here, Karina, and it's one that I get asked quite a lot, but how am HMRC going to know that I've made any gifts in my lifetime? Well, it's a good question. And they won't because they're not psychic, but they will um, expect you to know and they will expect you to um, have recorded it down. So I always say to clients, it's always a good thing to have a little folder, have your will in it, maybe have um, all of the details that, that might make things a lot easier for clients, um, uh, it's for clients, for your, their, your beneficiaries when you pass away. Now, I always say if you're planning on doing a gift, write it down so either document it and put it in your will folder and the date who it went to how much it was etc cetera, etc cetera. or print off your bank statement jot down circle the amount that went to um the person went to john on this date you know gift or whatever just because the beneficiaries who then um have to deal with all of this are able to then complete a form say these are the gifts that were done what these are when they were done 
um, and they didn't have to then trawl through the bank accounts and work out who was gifted what and when and why and how. Um, so they won't know, but they will expect you to know. So just a good idea just to make sure it's um, it's documented somewhere. And that's a really good reminder, actually, because when you were talking about the gifts out of excess income, what I always say to my clients as well is I say, do a bit of a budget, whether that's just handwritten on a piece of paper about what you're spending. And then if you are making gifts, be that for life cover or direct gifts, write down then what you're gifting as gifts out of, reg of excess income on a regular basis, which means at least annually. So then a bit like Karina was saying there with your gifts, it's exactly the same thing. So we can justify as the beneficiaries or, you know, whoever's your executors, they can then have that there to be able to explain it to HMRC because you might, you, know, you won't be around if they've got to pay inheritance tax. Yeah. Which leads me on to another question that clients ask. So um, who pays inheritance tax? Yes, it's basically down to the, the beneficiaries of your will um, to, to sort of co cover that debt. So it's obviously up to the executors to, to sort everything out. Um, so you nominate your executors in your will. Um, uh, obviously, if you're dealing with a solicitor, they'll help with sort of the, the inheritance tax um, forms that need to be completed, etc. But it's yeah, it's basically down to the executors to to sort of clear that debt before probate is granted and the uh, estate is passed on to who you want it to go on to. That's always very useful. It, it's never nice talking about these things, but I suppose we have to with inheritance tax, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. We talk about death a lot. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that you just have to be mindful of. And once you've done everything and it's all sorted, you put it in a drawer, forget about it, never have to worry about it again, knowing that you've done the right thing, you've planned, you've done your will, you've done your gifts, you've done your life cover, etc. And it's done and dusted and you can crack on and not have to think about it too much after that. <laughs> No, definitely, definitely. It's one of those things, isn't it, where you, you prepare for the worst um, and hope for the best. <laughs> exactly. Um, so one of the questions that's sort of similar to that is, how are my investments dealt with upon my death? Um, so generally speaking, the uh, most investments would um, be uh, pooled with the rest of your assets and obviously, you know, calculated. So everything would be calculated together and then the inheritance tax liability would um, be put, uh, calculated at that point, uh, apart from pensions, as we've mentioned. So pension assets wouldn't be subject to inheritance tax. They are outside of the estate um, for inheritance tax purposes. So the majority of your assets would probably just all be pulled together, calculated, inheritance tax bill uh, put together, and then obviously the, the bill would have to be paid to HMRC at that point. That's absolutely right. And what I would also say as well is um, part of the administration of estates and things like that, and, and having dealt with it a few times and supported a lot of people with it, um, you have to get a lot of death certificates because everyone wants an original death certificate. Mm. It goes into executors' accounts and things like that. You know, um, jointly held bank accounts, for instance, that will go to the remaining person. So you might, you're not going to be necessarily completely cut off, but it's worth planning for things like that because it, once it's an executor's account, you might not be able to access it mm. if it was just in one person's sole name. And a good example of that, um, Karina, I don't know if you've seen it, but is ISIS, for instance, mm. where you think, oh, I'm going to inherit that. That'll be fine. I've still got my income or I've still mm. got access to that, but you might not do. So that's why it's really worthwhile sort of having that conversation about that process with someone. Yeah, absolutely. You get a lot of couples who, who might have most of the assets in one name which is all fine, but just be mindful of the fact that if something were to happen to that person, that money could be tied up until probate is sorted. So it's always a good idea maybe to have some in the other person's name or joint accounts, as you said, Sophie, so they can access it in the interim. So just, again, one of those things just to bear in mind. Fantastic. Um, we're getting close to the end of this. So I'm really sorry. There's quite a few questions still unanswered. Um, so definitely speak to your advisor. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all because this is quite a, a an interesting topic for a lot of people, I think. So I'm so sorry because we've had so many attendees and questions. We haven't been able to get through them all. But mm. do raise those with your um, financial planner at Integrity 365 and we'd be more than happy to talk through. And especially if there's an area that's a little bit more more specialists so there's a couple of questions that have come in that are a little bit more specific mm -hmm. so we'd be more than happy to sort of talk that through with you but I want to end on um what is possibly my favorite question that we've been asked and something that um I, I talk about all the time which is that they've read in the news that the government may abolish inheritance tax what will happen if I've addressed my IHT issue 
and um, subsequently they abolish IHT altogether? Well, yes, that's a very good question. And who knows what the government are going to do? Um, you know, it's, they're always changing their mind. They always have inheritance tax on their radar. So, you know, they're always talking about making uh, changes to it. And, and they may well do. It's very difficult to, to sort of guess what they're going to do. All I would say that is any planning we would recommend that put, we put in place is based on legislation at the time. And we can't then foresee what's going to happen with legislation later on down the line, um, depending on what plans you put in place, etc. Obviously, there'll be certain things that can be done in order to, to make changes to it. It really does depend on, on what route you take. But um, generally speaking, I would always say that advice can only really be given on current legislation. It's very difficult for us to predict, as it is for anyone, what the government are going to do from one minute to the next. That's right. And, and if we could predict it, we probably wouldn't be sat here. We'd probably be... Um, somewhere far more exotic at this time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I would also add to that, there was a white paper that came out in July 2019, um, where they were talking about um, it sort of what changes they might possibly have to the inheritance tax world. And I was talking to all my clients about that at that time. Then apparently something big happened in 2020 and uh, it went to the <laughs> bottom of the agenda, uh, unsurprisingly. And it's been kicked around a lot since then. Um, in that white paper, they discussed, you know, the different options that they've got. And it was all about the simplification of inheritance tax. Now, they might well change the legislation, but especially when it comes to pensions, for instance, they are changing pensions legislation all the time. But what that might have um, sort of when we look retrospectively, so planning you've already done, is they tend not to make changes to retrospective things. Mm. So I think Karina's absolutely right. And we do give advice based on the legislation today. But the reality is, if there are big changes, the chances are you're better to have done the planning <laughs> than not <laughs> absolutely um, and we've definitely learned that with pensions because it was really nice of jeremy hunt to come out just at the end of the tax year and make a big change about yeah. pensions and how much you can hold in a pension just in time for us to all start panicking uh and and having that at the end of the tax year so don't ever panic with inheritance tax it's one of those things that's not reliant on the tax year end it's something to be aware of and plan with your family i'd say as well karina mm. I, I, um, I know you look after a lot of families, as do I, and it's a conversation for the whole family about what everyone feels is the best thing for sort of looking after the family, because it genuinely is one of those conversations that really is important to have with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I would yeah, definitely advocate to sort of getting the next generation involved and, and making sure that everyone's aware of, of what, what we're doing, because, you know, it like you say, it might be that uh, one person isn't particularly keen on one route or another route or whatever. And it's really important that everyone's aware of it. And the last thing we want to do is put plans in place and then someone rock up and say, oh, I wouldn't have done that if I were with you. I mean, so that's why it's always really important to make sure that you get everyone involved if you can and, and, and just sort of make it, like you say, a family, a family planning session if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Karina, for joining us today. And thank you for all these wonderful um, participants that we've had and Thank you for attending and giving up sort of 45 minutes of your Wednesday night. We really appreciate it. And we hope you found it useful. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.